Hi, I'm Rita Roy. I'm presenting my investigation of anti-bubble instability and evidence of criticalities. Um, an anti-bubble is something you may not be too familiar with, but it's a lot like a bubble. And in this investigation, I cover the instabilities and the criticalities of its, its existence. I don't go into its lifetime or the popping of a bubble. Um, I'll go through an introduction. Um, bubble nature and air pressure, formation materials and procedures, and investigations by experimenters, data and observations of those experiments, and the interpretations and conclusions, and then a summary for Q&A after. So a bubble is an air-liquid-air interface. Um, obviously you blow it through a little bubble wand and it floats in the air. An anti-bubble, on the other hand, is a liquid-air-liquid -liquid interface, and it's formed beneath a liquid. So underwater, there is an air surface that encapsulates um, another liquid, or the same liquid underneath. That's what an anti-bubble is. So if you hadn't heard of it before, they do exist. Now, bubbles also exist underwater. That would just be um, a complete air sphere under the water, whereas an anti-bubble is an air layer that encapsulates the liquid. Make sense? Okay, so there are applications for anti-bubble research. Um, they're trying to stabilize a, a long-lasting froth or an anti-foam. Just like we could have foam, soapy foam um, in the air or in your bathtub, they're trying to create a foam that would exist underwater. Um, it can be used as a lubricant or it could be used as thin passageways to filter air or other gases through water without disturbing the fluid, or through any fluid without disturbing the fluid. So you can remove pollutants, things like that. Um, they also are trying, in the medical field, they're trying to um, use anti-bubble research to be able to create very small drug-filled capsules that you could inject into your bloodstream. Um, each one would have a layer of what they call liquid, liquid polymer that would harden. And so instead of it being a liquid air liquid, it would be liquid polymer and then drug filled. And these would go into your system and hopefully be time released so that over time the drug would go into your system. So instead of giving yourself maybe an injection every day, you could give yourself an injection that would last longer. So that's what they're working on for the medical research. Um, bubble nature and air pressure. Uh, the surface of a bubble is where the molecules of the liquid feel force on three sides. Underneath they feel it on four sides, but on top there's no um, pressure from above. So it feels forces on three sides, which gives it an overall force um, felt up. So an overall upward force towards the surface. That. And the surface tension, this is, causes the surface tension, it will always work to minimize the surface. This is why bubbles have a spherical shape. Also, if you use a bubble wand of some kind, you'll notice it goes immediately flat, and that's what you blow through to make the spheres. But that all is based on the surface tension, trying to minimize the surface as much as possible. So the pressure inside the anti-bubble, the equation is P equals four, this is surface tension here, over the radius. This is the pressure inside of an anti-bubble. So it uses the, it already builds into this equation the multiple surfaces. Um, for the larger the bubble, the lower the pressure is, which is why the larger the bubble, the more unstable it is. Um, it's the same with regular soapy bubbles. Um, the Laplace-Young equation is used to describe pressure across one surface. So they use an equation like this, and they use it for each surface that the antibubble has, and that's how they get the, the four sigma over r. And these are the radiuses of those um, surfaces, that change in pressure. Thank you, Laplace-Young. Formation materials and procedures. So um, the reason why these surfaces exist has to do a lot with the polarity and the molecules. So for water molecules, there is um, a heavy side and kind of a light side, and they 
they're illustrated here as having um, a hard head and kind of a squiggly tail. But um, this is kind of give you the polar oriented surface molecules. So half the molecule has an electric pole that attracts the water. That's the head part. It's attracted to the blue areas. This is a regular standard bubble, and this is the anti-bubble layer. The other half is a long oily tail, they call it, which repels it, so it points towards the air part. And each of these will line up to minimize the surface. And these positively charged nucleus and the neg negatively charged electron cloud tend to have the polarity, and they behave like the magnets, so they all like go right to that surface and align up perfectly. Okay, so investigation by experimentation. Antibubbles have been created by pouring a container of soapy liquid and observing the, the droplets as they pass into the liquid below the surface. Um, that was done by certain experimenters, pouring a container that will create antibubbles under the surface. Another way to do it, um, or oh, another way to videotape these is you need high-speed cameras, really, and on a small scale. So a lot of the, the best anti-bubbles that are produced always have the smallest diameters. So um, the best experiments that have been done do use these high-speed cameras. Um, and then instead of just pouring the liquid in, they actually have used technology again and produced jet streams that go into the surface. So they can have more control over how, how many bubbles are being formed and at what rate. Um, and this was done by Nevels and Lockhart in the University of Wisconsin. This is um, their, their way out there. And um, I'll go into them a little bit more too as they, they did a lot of really good bubble res anti bubble research. Um, so the formation of an anti bubble under the surface. The jet stream coming down, it eventually breaks into droplets due to the Raleigh plateau instability. This is the cylindrical sheath here coming down, and you can see the instabilities in the sheath. You could also see it if you try to blow a bubble wand, those instabilities happen there too. And eventually the sheath gets these little um, bulges, and the bulges break and create a bubble in the end as it increases. So th this is part of a, a critical value. Once it reaches this critical instability, it pinches off and creates the bubble under the water. So the top is a progression um, of an oscillation form. So this is not just pouring the liquid in, but it is um, a jet stream that's being controlled with um, a controlled oscillation. And the bottom row is just the progression of one anti-bubble formation. So you can see the same cylindrical sheath and then pinches off into its bubble. And the frames are not necessarily evenly separated by time. I think, you know, they just came up with the best pictures. Okay, so data and observations. So the summary of the bubble to anti-bubble comparison, right? I kind of presented both of these. The, we deal with the thickness and the radius of the anti-bubble and what the surface molecules are doing. Dorbolo and van der Waal are scientists at the Institute of Physics in Belgium, and they were able to produce anti-bubbles that had an average diameter of 1.6 centimeters and an average thickness of 3 micrometers. And they showed a stable lifetime of about 2 minutes, but I'm not going to go into the lifetime in this presentation. Um, kind of summing up a couple of different experiments, the, this is the Nevels and Lockhart experiment with the high-speed cameras and the plexiglass. Um, and this is Dorbolo and Van der Waal took a picture of some of the bubbles that they created. I also personally got to interview an anti-bubble creator, experimenter named Jessica Morgan. She's actually the winner of the Massachusetts Re Region 5 High School Science Fair with her project on anti-bubbles. She successfully produced similar results to that of Dorbolo and Van der Waal using the methods presented by Nevels and Lockhart. So she kind of combined a little bit of both. Um, she, used the, she tried to use the plexiglass setup and the jet stream they use, but she was producing what are called liquid onions. This slide, liquid onions are when a droplet passes through another surface and then instead of there being an air layer, instead she used oil and had an oil layer with the water inside. So this is like a soapy water, a glycerin water mix, which is what Dor Dorbolo and Van der Waal, um, they actually coined the term liquid onion. So. Interpretations and conclusions. Nevels and Lockhart claimed, their experiment, claimed in their experiment the surface energy 
um, and the incident energy are proportional to each other. So that pouring of, their wa of the water or the jet stream of the water, once it hits the surface and creates the bubble, that incident energy creates a, a chain reaction into all these other criticalities. So it was no surprise that Dorbolo and Van der Waal were able to connect a critical depth related to the critical pressure. So it all is kind of a chain reaction off of this incident energy and the creation of the anti-bubble. So like I said, anti-bubbles are droplets that are surrounded by a thin film of gas, air, and there are several places that you can observe them and you can also make them yourselves very easily. Um, so to sum up, these are my pressure equations. These are my experimenters that I researched. I researched a lot of other um, information that's out there on anti-bubbles, but these were kind of the people that I really wanted to introduce you guys to in this presentation. So. Um, again, relating surface tension to surface energy and also critical depth to critical pressure. And like I say, the problem successfully encompasses a masterful blending of theory and experiment. The theory of the pressure and the theory of the energy related relations to the actual experiments that were presented. Thank you. Do you want me to go first since I'm, I got okay. my hand? I mean, so I can direct a question. Shoot. Any I'll, questions? I'll get started. So, uh, on the liquid, on the, I'm sorry, the, the, what do you call it? Liquid onion, liquid yeah. Onion, right? It's a crazy name. If you, you had water and oil, right? Mm -hmm. The oil is buoyant, right, in water. So I assume that the, the oil layer that wraps around that uh, droplet eventually, uh, or who can be tasked because of the buoyancy forces. So the water drop would like to go down while the oil particles would like to go up. So it starts to separate. Is that one of the reasons that, you know, these have a short lifetime? In fact, the oil combination is what extended the lifetime. That's what Jessica approached the, this concept with. Um, Anti-bubbles lifetimes were very short because they would float right to the top um, or float right to the bottom, or, you know, and, and just pop once it hits the surface. But when they introduced the oil layer, it actually got the anti-bubbles to live that much longer. I think that's because air is much more buoyant in water than, yeah. uh, than oil. Yeah, so that's, that's why they used the oil. I have other questions. I want to let the class uh, ask any questions. Yes, correct. Other than like air and oil, do they use, or did someone ever theorize using other chemicals or other form? Yes, well, glycerin, glycerin mix, so it's like soapy water. Um, you, you can't use just regular water because the surface tension of water is too high. So that's why the glycerin, the soap, is what makes the bubble actually exist. Um, I think the goal in the long term would be to use other gases, um, especially, you know, if that's what you're trying to, um, you know, the pollutants you're trying to evade from, from your experiment or um, to be able to put something into your bloodstream. You know, you don't want to be putting air into your bloodstream, so I'm sure they would come up with other um, solvents. solutions for 0, 1, and 5, and for other we have to use, there is polytropic calculator, and like uh, from Clemson University, you just give the polytropic number, and it will plot the curve, and using that curve, 
uh, once we have this polytropic model, uh, we can calculate uh, these numbers uh, dn, mn, rn, and dn. 